Coach Greenlee. Welcome to the Ohio Cast podcast. How are you doing tonight, Coach Greenlee? Doing great. How about you? I'm hanging in there. You know what? Here, I, I should have you. You know, there's another podcast that I do called the Kent State Wrestling Talk. But I, I think you might be the new co host this week because you put it on the Golden Flash. It's pretty good on Friday for the Grudge Match Trophy. Uh, what did the score? It was seven matches to three, right? Yeah. I don't, I, uh, tw- 28 to 12, maybe. 28 to 12. So you guys, you dominated Kent State. You've had a pretty good dual season this year. Uh, yeah. We've been up and down, but I think we're all right. I mean, yeah, you guys are all right. It's tough though. You're in the Mid American Conference. This isn't, you know, it's not like you're you're a Power Five school and you're up against Power Five schools. Who did you guys have a win? Did you guys beat WVU to start the season? Is that who you guys had a big win over? Uh, no. I'm trying to think of who we. Man, you gotta you, you gotta ask me easier questions than that. <laughs> uh, I remember uh, who we lost to, not who we won. <laughs> um, but okay, so this is year. Um. 26 for you yeah yeah uh, so you're the second longest tenured coach in the mid-american conference are you the second longest in the country as well as far as at one place who uh no i don't think so john smith's been at oklahoma state lawyer now i'm pretty john sure smith you got uh, john smith you got borelli but borelli's been at central longer than john smith's been the head coach at oklahoma state right Right. Yeah. Um, I'd have to think about that for sure. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know about that. I never even thought about that. Well, I mean, I, that, that's why we through. have you on here. Your big win this year was, first off, you beat Cleveland State, who's having a great season. Um, yep. Uh, you lost to Northern Illinois, South Dakota State. Uh, you were at the Virginia Duels, right? Correct. Virginia Duels, you wrestled. Uh, all power five schools with UVA, Maryland, Oklahoma, and uh, South Dakota State. And then in the MAC, you guys do have a winning record. Um, you guys are uh, what three and two? Well, then the MAC and the MAC. You're three and two in the MAC. So I mean, you know, that's how it goes sometimes when you run into a, a bunch of power five schools and you're a MAC school. I think that's what you're going to get. You're going to get a mixed bag like that, right? Yeah, I, I mean, we we may be overscheduled a little bit, but um, for me, I think you have to see um, you have to see some of those teams get you know. Hopefully, you can get some wins, maybe win a duel or two. But you got to figure out where you're at and uh, if you're on the right track. And if you're not on the right track, what you need to do different to to get to where you want to go at the end of the year. Like you're saying, you may have may have overscheduled a little bit. You know, like when you get into that um, that Virginia Duels one, there is a Big Ten team at the Virginia Duels, which is odd to me that Maryland does go because most of the Big Ten they start doing their Big Ten duels the beginning of January. Well, they have, usually have made like an oddball one at the end of December usually, and then they get into their their uh, their Friday Sunday duels that they do two days a uh, two days a week. Uh, yeah. January, February. So it's kind of shocking to me, but it's probably close for Maryland and not, you know, it's quick travel and a quick turnaround for them. So I can see them being there. But um, you look at what you guys did as a conference last year. You guys did not have, an, did not have anybody in the round of 12 in the toughest NCAA tournament. And you've been to every NCAA tournament. And, you know, since the mid 80s, Joel Greenlee has either wrestled in, been at, or coached in every NCAA tournament. Is that an accurate statement? Yes. Was last year, you know, we had an eighth-year guy who was an Olympian, and then we had all these six-year COVID guys. Was last year the toughest NCAA tournament, a top two or three NCAA tournament that you've ever been to as a competitor or a coach? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, all the all the sixth-year guys, stuff like that really made it pretty tough, I think. Here's the wild thing about you. You wrestled in an era where you wrestled the D2 champ in the finals, right? You wrestled six-time NCAA champ Carlton Hasselreg in the NCAA finals, and that was when the D2 and the D3s could wrestle the week before, win their nationals, and then they were invited to the D1s, right? Correct. I'm not not sure of the year. I don't know. It was either my my junior year or my senior year I wrestled at – the D three champ first round. And then obviously my senior year, I wrestled 
uh, Hasselrig in the finals. Who was the D three champ? Do you remember what school at least? You know, I think it was. I, I think it was a kid from Ohio Northern, actually. No way! Are you serious? I would have to go back and look, but I, I know it was a D three champ. That is wild to me, and, and I, you. I think it was. That's what I remember. It was his Ohio Northern kid. <laughs> I we, listen. We can look that up. That's what I love about this doing it on the fly. We can pick your schedule up. See who you guys have wrestled, look at it, talk about it. Mixed bag this year, like we're talking, but you put it on the golden flashes. Back to how we intro the show. How good does it feel to win that grudge match trophy? And whose idea was the grudge match trophy, Coach Greenley? I think it was both of ours, but I'll give you credit. How's that? Uh, it was <laughs> your idea, by the way. It was not my idea. And the year we made it, you guys kind of had a lock on it because Cody Walters was on the team. Romanchik, uh, Sparty Chino. I mean, you guys, uh, Pa, uh, geez, oh, Pete, uh, Her Harrison Hightower, probably Harrison. And then, uh, who's the flying knee guy? Oh, Taiwan Claxton. Taiwan Claxton. He beat the, he beat the, the Kyle Bauer guy. No, I think they beat you that year. The following year, they beat you. But I know Claxton was on the team that year. So it's 2014. I got screamed at. And Tracy's like, you only make the trophy. He convinced you to make the trophy the year they're going <laughs> to beat us. And I see how it is. Uh, but the guys on this team think you went to Ohio and Ohio State. And I'm like, dude, what do you want, man? I'm trying to promote wrestling. Can't all just be. In, in all honesty, I think we lost to Kent State the year before. And that's that's kind of when I talked to you about the thing. Just because I think I think having those rivalries and in, in, I, I'll, I'll – I'll get it wrong, but like I know Iowa and, and Minnesota play for the the Floyd or Rosedale, you know, the the pig statue and somebody plays for the old oak and bucket and yeah. and all the and I, Paul I just think axe. Yeah, yeah. I just think those things are kind of cool. Yeah, I like I listen, it was your idea. I refuse to take any credit for it, but Scott Blank made the first trophy. Let's talk about the first trophy, because I'm not happy about the first trophy, okay? So Scott Blank on the plasma cutter at the high school where I work, Riverside High School, he made a pretty cool trophy. It was pretty unique, and yep. um, it had a uh, it had a, a wooden backboard to it, and then it was plasma cut. Looked pretty cool. As I thought it was unique, and apparently Kent State had some scumbags on their team that transferred out and took the tr the trophy with them for when you guys beat it last. Year. You beat them last year. You did not get the plaque, the traveling plaque last year. In Ken, Ohio. And I think you had guys like saying stuff to me. And I'm like, listen, man, I didn't steal the trophy. I made the trophy. You <laughs> have the trophy because of me. I don't want to hear it, man. And the dude was like, he apologized. He was cool about it. I forget who it was. And I was like, hey, don't talk to me like that. And, he, you know, the kid got it. He understood that maybe he overstepped a little bit. But I, you know what I mean? I didn't steal the trophy. That first trophy was cool. I thought it was neat. But who made us the second trophy that you guys just wanted? It's like a, a square, right? Yeah, it, it's um it's it's made of metal and all uh, a guy named brian davis he used to i i know him from he was a coach at morgan county his kids grew up there and he moved over by indian lake now and that that's what he does for a living and um i was i was trying to think of something obviously i'm not the most creative person in the whole world and uh i kind of sent brian a picture of the the old one and said i was on the coach's show at, at um for football or something like that and i the the place that they hold it sells all those iron things on the wall and i was sitting there looking at those and i think you know what something like that would be pretty cool so uh i called brian and brian uh said yeah i can i, I can do something and uh he sent me a couple examples and the first one it was kent state rockets and uh, <laughs> that wasn't gonna work <laughs> uh... and that's it yeah, keep going. I said, that's all that's all fine and dandy, Brian, but it, it, it's the Toledo Rockets. And he's like, okay, I'll fix it. And he fixed it. And, and I kind of just let him do what he wanted. And I think he did a great job. I think that's when people are at their best, man. When you give people the ball and let them run with it and let their creativity creativity go to work. I obviously what you did is awesome. Um, where is the plaque? Where is the 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 traveling trophy, the the grudge match trophy? Where is it now? It's in our locker room. Okay. Because I know Andresi, I know I owned a couple different houses that I had Kent State Runners in, and I would go in, and it would be on the mantle. So a couple different years on a couple different houses, it was on the mantle. 
Do you ever let the guys take it home? No. We already I mean, know I mean, why. Think, we already know think... what happens if you do that. We know what happens. Well, I think uh, first of all, I think it's it, it's something you go in the locker room and you look at every day, and um, you, you know, uh, it's a rivalry match for us. Obviously, I mean, th there's you know, we're, we we go back and forth recruiting, all that stuff. So, I want our guys to see it. I want them to be proud of it. I want them to see it every single day. So you guys, uh, you and Kent State is a good rivalry. I like it. I think your crowd gets rowdy. I think their crowd gets rowdy. I like it. I think that you do a great job in the convo. But you've told me before, you know, it's like you asked me about this Max Soviak singlet that Barbarian made, and it's a military appreciation singlet for Milan Edison High School, who's got a pretty good team in Division Three, have been runner-up the last couple of years. Um, but you guys do a military appreciation night, and you've told me yeah. in the past, you, you know, someone mentored you into that. Who told you to make things an event and honor people? And who really, like, kind of guided you down that path to start doing things like, you know, you do a camouflage singlet at Ohio University. You do a military appreciation. You do the graduation. Who really told you to make the event out of things? Uh, truth be told, it was Jay Robinson. Uh, you know, he said people don't, people don't come – and I, I still have the paper in in a folder in in uh, in my office. Like people don't come to events because you're winning. They come because it's an event. They come because, hey, I can come ten minutes before and I get reserved seats and all, all all those things. So, I don't think we can incorporate all the ideas he had. And he was kind of a master marketer. I mean, I, I remember going to Minnesota um, when I was in college, and we'd go up there and wrestle them before Jay was there, and there would be. 4,000 people at the hockey game next door and 50 people at the wrestling meet. Um, and, and now you go to a, a Minnesota match and it's, it's, it's a huge crowd. So he kind of was a master marketer and, and things like that, but that's, that's really where I, I got a lot of those ideas. You know, you come to Ohio university under some really interesting circumstances and in, uh, was it 96, 97, your first year, Joel, or was it 97, 98, 97, 98, 97, 98. So, I have a super unique experience with you because you recruited me in 1997. My mom and dad and I came down. My dad took the longest, most horrendous way down. We took Route 13 from, I remember, like Sandusky, Milan, Norwalk area, and we drove all the way down to Athens. It was like a six-hour trip. It should not be a six-hour trip. I just got to put that out there. <laughs> it should not be a six-hour trip. He made her a six-hour trip. We get there. And I remember your graduate assistant. Who was your graduate assistant? Because that's all you had at that time. Uh, Devin Shea. Devin Shea. That's right. Yeah. It was just you and him. Your first year was a wild year, man. It was wild. Because I was oh, a senior yeah. in high school. You were recruiting me. I was an average middle-of-the-road guy, a state qualifier once. Ended up placing a state my senior year. And I remember... You had two NCA finalists, and what did you guys take as a team your first year as the interim head coach? Ninth. <laughs> your first year, you took ninth in the country, and you had two NCA finalists and a champ, right? Right. We only took two guys. <laughs> <laughs> best in, best NC tournament, the NCAA tournament ever. <laughs> uh, hey, save the best for first, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So Gardner makes the finals. He beats Hardell more and right makes the finals and loses to Ironside. Do I have that right? Is that doesn't, is that you, not? Yeah, you're correct. Yeah. yeah is that right. right? I was a kind of a yeah. shot in the dark. I didn't even look that one up. Um, What was that like your first year? What was going through your mind? Because you replaced a legend, Harry Huska. So that's the other thing. I want to talk about that dynamic, but just tell me about the first year in Athens, Ohio. Did you come from Northern Iowa or where did you come from? Northern Iowa. So you did yeah. come from, and you're from Northern Iowa. You're from Waverly, Ohio, or Waverly, Iowa, right? Yeah. So how far is Waverly Shell Rock High School from the Uni Dome? Uh, thirty miles. Is it thirty miles? It's that. It's, I thought it was like fifteen minutes. It's thirty minutes, huh? Yeah. So you effectively went to thirteenth grade. We'll try <laughs> anybody from Waverly Shell Rock. They don't want to go away to college. They go to Northern Iowa. Is that an accurate statement? Uh, yeah. I, I said, well, there's, there's also Wartburg college. They've won 
I don't know, 12 national titles in wrestling. That's right in Waverly, but I didn't want to, you know, I wanted to wrestle in division one and I had opportunities to go to Iowa, Iowa state, a lot of different places. And, uh, for and truth be told i probably had my mind made up before it started that i was going to go to iowa and um when i went on my visit there it was just that 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 place felt like home and it's closer to home well um, is iowa two hours from uh from waverly hour and a half probably it's, so it's, it's not, wow i can't believe iowa is super weird because it's very rural and everything that's like Iowa State is, uh, was it north of Ames? I'm sorry, north of Des Moines in Ames. Yep. And then you guys are north of Iowa City, right? Yeah. And there's not much. I mean, there's not like when I say that, there's not like besides Des Moines and Iowa City and Cedar Rapids, there's not a ton going on in Iowa. There's a lot. Of, it's a lot of farm and agriculture, right? There's a lot of cornfields between between the three of them. That's that's about it. And then you got like anomalies like Fort Dodge. It's where you know Iowa Central is. It there's not a whole lot going on there. So nope. Iowa, Iowa's super rural, and you know obviously the greatest college team of all time, arguably with this these Penn State teams now was the 19, late 1970s and the 80s Iowa Hawkeyes, right? Yeah, I think I think. Uh... The 90, 97 team when they ho hosted the Nationals in the Unidome, that might be the the highest points ever scored by one Iowa 171, team. I think, is what the points was in five champs. Yeah, I wouldn't know the points off the top I, of my head. It's but... 171, I believe. Yeah. Um, so you you know, and then obviously we got to throw those great Oklahoma State teams from the fifth, the fifties, sixties, seventies. They had some great teams, so I got to mention that. But like. If we look at the golden era, you know, the Iowa, you, you grew up under the Gable era, you know, Iowa public television, right? Yeah. And they, they you know, they were, hey, they were trying to win 10 in a row. Yeah. They got stopped at nine. Yeah. By Iowa state, right? Yeah. In, in 1987. Hey, fun fact. Do you know who put it out of reach mathematically? The Stuart Carter. Dave Orndorff. Oh Yeah. Dave Orndorff beat the Iowa dude in the semis, I want to say. Uh, That's a, so, yeah, 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 because then he lost to Hasselrig. Yeah. How wild is that, dude? That is wild. That is your era. Because you were yeah. you were senior the year before, right? No. A uh, year after. That was my junior year. I got fourth that, was, that year. So you got fourth that year. Who beat you for third and fourth? Uh, Mark Tatum, guy from Oklahoma. So Mark Tatum beat it, and then Orndorfer's runner up to Hasselrick. Yep. Who was behind you fifth and sixth? Do you remember? Uh, Mark Sendlinger from Iowa might have been fifth, sixth. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Did you beat Sendlinger Singler in the Conti semis? No, I didn't wrestle him. Uh, I wrestled him in the duel that year, and then he might have. He might have beat me on the championship side and then we didn't wrestle on the console side gotcha but you finished ahead of him yeah so you were in this like ultimate era like gable era right like it was like everybody was drinking the kool-aid but obviously gibbons did a great job at iowa state so you were there in the thick of all of that that's what's awesome about hearing it because it takes a lot for a person to go to the third school, a lot of people call it the, the Northern Iowa the third school. You already know that. I'm not not being offensive to the to the Panthers, but it's considered the third school. They don't have Division One football. What are they one double A in football? Yeah, one double. Or what do they call it? FCS Subdivision. Now. So FBS. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, that's that's tough for you to do that. Did you go up to Minnesota from Northern Iowa? Because I know you trained the whole time until you went to Ohio, right? Uh, yeah, basically, yes. So, what were the stops from '89? You and I, what were your stops? Did you just stay there? Did you go to Minnesota? Where did you all go? Well, so I, I, I wanted to stay at Northern Iowa and train and all that stuff, but they didn't really have a position for me. Um, so I took a job at Clarion and and basically over the summer and trained with Kurt Angle, but then a position opened up before school started at New Northern Iowa. 
So I never really was at Clarion and uh, really, really stayed at Northern Iowa. Um, kind of my, my, you know, where I went a ton to train as far as competition and stuff like that was I, I trained with Bruce Bumgarner almost every summer from probably my sophomore year in college on. And then how many times were you the number two to Bruce Bumgarner? Mm, that's what the, the, that a lot. <laughs> like like six times, something crazy like that, right? Yeah. Oh, my God, dude. So then when Tolly Thompson was training and made a world championships, were you training with Tolly Thompson then? Or was he at Nebraska? He was at Nebraska, but he was he was at Northern Iowa when he went when, when he would he get fourth in the world or did he get third? I I don't I he, can't remember off. I that. believe he 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 placed. Okay, so he got third. So he's a bronze medalist. He was at Northern Iowa. He he would he'd already left Nebraska. Was an assistant at Northern Iowa. I was already at Ohio. Um, I I I, I think the year before that, it was either the year before that or two years before that is, is when I kind of stopped competing. Got it. So would it be 96, 97? Uh, yeah, it was right before I came to Ohio. So 96, 97. Yeah. Uh, it's just crazy to think that you came in and you ran into this, like, golden situation. You're a top 10 team in your interim year. But what was it like making that transition from Harry Huska to Joel Greenlee? Because there was this crazy thing. Do we even whatever, – whatever happened? Did they put him on leave? Whatever happened with Harry Huska? You know what? <laughs> to be totally honest, I don't know. It's it's clearly water under the bridge from 25 years ago. I think we're allowed to talk about it, but like you never even got the full situation, did you? No, I mean, like, like you, I I know Harry's side of the story. I know the administration side of the story. Um, probably truth somewhere lies in the middle of the two. And I just tried to stay out of it and, and not really get involved with Harry, not really get involved with the administration and just go down the middle and, and keep my head down and work hard. What did, when did they tell you in that interim year, like, Hey, you're going to, we're going to give you an interview or you're going to be the guy. How did you know? And what was that process like? And what was it like coaching a team full of Harry Huska's guys and having one of the greatest years in the history of Ohio university wrestling? Uh, okay, so to answer the first question, when did I know? Uh, September, the following year. They didn't tell you you were being hired as the head coach until September so I, '98. Yeah, so I was a, <laughs> I was an interim, interim guy that year. And then I was on a nine month contract, but so I got a job being the supervisor of student workers on campus over the summer to kind of make ends meet and. Uh, I did that and I'd go, we'd practice in the afternoon over the summer and I'd work a couple hours in the office and do whatever I had to do. And, um, you know, budget was tight for Ohio at the time. And that's kind of the, one of the ways our, our, um, AD at the time would make ends meet. And, um, I, I didn't get hired until August, September, the following year. Wow. So what's crazy for me is I talked to John Worthy, John Worthy's son, Denver, and my son, Bird, yeah. are on, they're on the same baseball team. And I see him, I was like, hey, I'm having, uh, you know, Greenlee's going to be on the show. What's weird to me is, though, is um, you were, it was, I believe it was three years he was under Harry and two years under you, something like that, or two years under Harry, three years under you, and Harry's the guy who recruited, you know, John Worthy. So it's like, some of these guys are like, they're 50-50, they're split between you know, they came in and were recruited by Harry and then they're they're finishing their career through you. What was that like? And was there any change from you to Harry? Obviously, there was big change. Okay. He's super old school. He's a national champ there. Super old school, says whatever's on his mind. You're not that. Okay. You're Joel Greeley. You're everybody's pal. You're a nice guy. He whoops some butt when you have to. But what was that transition like coaching Huska's guys, then starting to get your own guys? Uh, yeah, I think it was exciting. I think it was exciting for the guys on the team. Uh, I mean, you know, you were on edge a little bit here and there, but for the most part, uh, all, all the guys kind of welcomed me with open arms and it was a whole different, um, uh, breath of fresh air maybe. And, and I don't, I don't think different is always better or different is always bad. It was just different. Um, and 
I think the guys really kind of fed off it and we tried to um, maybe make them all think they were a little bit better than they would and they kind of are where they than they were and they all bought into it and um, we had a few great years with those guys. So in your third year, right, it would have been the last year for Huska's guys. In 2001, you guys win the Mid-American Conference, and you kind of break up the Central Michigan dynasty, right? Nobody won it besides you guys or Central Michigan for like over a 10-year stretch, and then Mizzou came into the league, right? Correct. So winning it as a head coach, like just think about your first five years there, right? Your first five years there, your first year you got two national finalists. By your fourth, third year, you're winning uh, the MAC title at home and at the Convocation Center, beating a team that you know nobody could beat in the Mid American Conference. Tom Borelli had that that system figured out, but your first five years were amazing, right? I mean, you were rolling. What's going through your mind after you win a MAC title? You're like, hey man, we're, we're going to get it done here. We're going to get the job done. We're going to win the MAC title every year. Uh, I don't know if I ever really thought about it that way. I mean, I. I you know, kind of my thing is, hey, just just be the best you can every day. And um, not that I, we don't talk about winning MAC titles and being all Americans and national champs and all those things, but uh, it's not not our sole focus. Is our sole focus is pretty much to being the best you you can be and and getting better and better every day. So Northern but, Illinois has some guys. They had some pretty good teams in the early two thousands, and then you you stumble upon a kid from Amherst, Ohio. Right. So it doesn't, it yeah. doesn't, it's not like you have these valleys at Ohio university. You've had it, you know, you've had all Americans year in and year out, but the guy, probably the greatest guy you've ever coached in the history of the program. This is my opinion. Jake Percival comes from Amherst still high school. And as a freshman, you redshirt him. Then as a freshman, he comes in the NCAA tournament, pulls arguably one of the biggest upsets in the history of the NCAA tournament. What was it like coaching a guy like Jake Percival? <laughs> uh man it was a lot of fun uh, obviously because he was he was really really good um but it was a lot of fun from the standpoint of a, he was a happy-go-lucky guy nothing really bothered him um he he was a competitor he hated to lose he would give you everything he had every single time out um and he had a lot to give <laughs> don't get me wrong i mean he 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 wrestled in two all-star meets, uh, you know, majored Ryan Bertine in one of them and beat uh, the kid from Stanford that was a national champ in the Gentry. other one. So the guy who he Gentry. beat, the guy who beat him for an NCAA title. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, I, I, you know, his freshman year, he went up, uh, he went up to Eastern Michigan Open, I think at the time, unattached and beat Kalziki who was a returning all American. Okay. So it's 2002. You're in the quarterfinals. You're the eight seed. You're wrestling the co Hodge favorite, Mike Zadick. Yeah. You're wrestling Mike Zadick. Zadick takes you down right away. This is, listen, this match is super, it's chronicled because ESPN was doing the Iowa wrestling Matt man. They were doing a, 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 one of the shows on Iowa Matt wrestling Matt men, right? Maka I have that. Freshman. I have that video there. It's yeah. And Jake Percival absolutely would sheds Mike Zadick. I think it was a point or two away from attack. If he would have wrote him out like the last 10 seconds, it would have been a tech fall at the writing time. So it was, it was by 14. He beat the number one guy. They were talking about splitting the hodge between him and Kale Sanderson that year. Yeah. I mean, he was smashing everybody. He's on a roll. And Jake Percival, he kept tilting him, didn't he? He was tilting. Was he cross wristing him? What was he doing to him? Uh, he'd get that uh, rebar. As well oh, I that reinforced it. bar tilt, right? Yeah. And turned him four times with it, five times with it, something crazy like that. It was 18 to four. That's what it was. First of all, you got to have Percival on here to tell the story. You know, I'm the most excited guy in the world after that match, and Jake's calm and cool. I think I, you know, he got his water bottle and I knocked it out of his hands and spilled it all over. But, you know, you have Jake tell the story and, you know, the first thing he does is like, wait, well, he's like, he went out and he took me down right away. And I looked and I go, oh, he's got hunting socks on. That's weird. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he wore those big, just, stupid wool socks. Yeah. And that was, 
And then he's like, this match might suck. He took me down already. And then I got away and took him down and go, eh, maybe it's not so bad. <laughs> you listen to Jake tell the whole story. It's unbelievable. But and that's just kind of who he was. Calm, cool, calm, cool and collected. And um, those things didn't really bother him. I mean, it's one of the biggest upsets. I mean, it, OK, so let's just say this. It would be the biggest upset probably in NCAA history if Jake Percival wouldn't have gone on and been a four-time All-American, right? But as yeah. was, it kind of gave his barometer and, you know, where his trajectory was going and a national finalist. And um, that's what's amazing about it to me is, you know, nobody knew who this fra- – he was a freshman. He was a freshman. The other guy and was he had a great year. senior. He had a great year too. Uh, I, I mean, uh, I can't think of the guy's name, but there was a kid that wrestled at Lehigh. And we went to, they called them the Sheridan duels or something like that at, at Lehigh. And um, that guy was the number one kid in the country coming out, but supposed to be all everything. And um, I think he was beating Jake by six and Jake came back and, and, and ended up beating him in that duel. And uh, that's when I knew, you know, that's probably December, early January. Maybe that's when I knew, man, this guy's, this guy's something special. It's crazy to think, man, that, you know, you get this guy down there and he just, he, he's a terror, but like off the mat, unassuming, doesn't look like much, kind of a tall drink of water, lanky, you know, and like, and then he's just a killer. He's a, and he was good. It was really, it was great on the mat. He was great on top. Yeah. And he had the great bar tilt series and, you know, he just, that guy was and something he'd else. Absolutely, he'd absolutely be. He'd absolutely be mortified if he knew we were talking about him and saying how good he was. Like, I remember, I distinctly remember in the airport on the way back to Athens. Um, I, I'll pick a school. We'll say Lehigh. This guy came up to him. It's like, oh, congratulations! It was a great tournament. They're talking about how good he was. And Jake looks at his shirt. He's got a Lehigh logo shirt on, and he's like, "Oh, your school did great too." And he, <laughs> um, he did. He never has or wants to talk about how good he really was. He was incredible. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you may agree, but that's probably the greatest guy in the history of Ohio University wrestling. No, I agree. Without a doubt, I agree. Full body of work, you know. I mean, it's incredible. And obviously, you guys have had some incredible guys. Obviously, Dwight Gardner. And we talk about Dwight Gardner. That guy's really good. And you've had some great Harry. He was four time Mac champ, four time All American. You know, but you you've always been able to keep it a super high level. You know, after Jake Percival, there wasn't like there was this big fall off, and then it was a desert down there for years. You couldn't win. It wasn't that. No, you go right into your Jeremy Johnson's the guy I like to think of, right? The J train, right? Yeah. Jeremy Johnson is an absolute, the epitome of what, what a worker is and what hard work will get you in the sport of wrestling. Um, yeah. He was, he was actually taunting me as well. Uh, a couple of days ago on Twitter, he posted the meat score uh, of the grudge match. And I was like, oh man, you got me. You got me. <laughs> Even on the guy who promotes the match, you got me. Ah, oh, sick burn. <laughs> Boom roasted, whatever, but. He was a two-time All-American. It worked. All American, it worked. Right? It, it, yeah, he was two-time worked. All-American. He actually beat uh, the guy from his Michigan. hit list is incre- incredible. He beat, I want to say, Adam Kuhn in the round of twelve. He beat the Adam Kuhn in the round of twelve to be an All-American in senior year. Gwizdowski for seventh and eighth. His sophomore year. Yes, Gwizdowski I mean, for he, seventh and eighth. Yes. Everybody. Uh, uh, you know he beat mulligan he beat like the guys he beat in college is is phenomenal and uh you know he's probably one of the hardest workers i've ever been around like used to drive me crazy it would be our day off and we didn't have to get up at six in the morning and train would be like hey coach can you come in and put me through some footwork drills at six it's like yeah i can (laughs) it's crazy though the one year for me i was sitting on the mat and i was in that one corner when you guys had like four guys in the round of 12 lose. And the one that should that had no business losing was Taiwan Claxton. Yeah. Oh, that the, was uh... the the Le- the Lockhaven guy, Dan Neff, did a flip in overtime and got yeah. out. It was like <laughs> I wanted to throw up on the mat. He was in the round of 12. Cody Walters in the round of 12. Sparty in the round of 12. Harrison Hightower's in the round of 12. That sounds right, right? Yeah, that sounds right. And it was all in the one corner of the dog bone. It was, nothing was done on the other end because I just sat right where I was. 
you know, because my nephews wrestling at the time. And I'm yeah. like, oh, my God. I wanted to go throw up in the hallway. That was torture. You. Oh, my God. What was that, that 14, was, 14 yeah. 2014, probably? 25th, yeah, 14. Uh, somewhere around there. That was, that, and listen, I know it was brutal for you, too, dude. Four guys in the round of 12. Oh, my God. Yeah, that was, that was bad. The worst one, though. And we were, the they were all like, uh, Taiwan probably should have won, in all honesty, but. You know, like we harp on guys about step around, lift, throw the guy around, you know, throw the guy down. But as soon as he stepped around, lift, that guy hit a Granby and yep. midair. You could see it. Oh. And they were all good matches. You know, Sparty lost to uh, Murphy. Brian Murphy, a fellow from, Illinois guy from Michigan. Yeah, I mean. In overtime. Yeah. Yeah. Sparty and, was doing this. Had him. Had him on the edge a couple of times. I mean. Yeah, I mean, it was a <laughs> heck of a match. And then uh, Cody, I'm trying to think of uh, maybe uh, McCut, uh, Crutchmer from Oklahoma State, maybe. Yep, that sounds right. Yeah. And then I forget who Har Harrison's was the least close of the three matches, of the four matches. Uh, His might have been like Nate Yates or someone like that. I was thinking uh, Nebraska guy. Eh, we could go look it up. We could go look yeah. it up. I, yeah, Harrison Hightower is an awesome guy. He transferred into you, the university school guy. He transferred in from Virginia Tech, right? Correct. And then you had him for four of the five years, right? Correct. I think – so we talk about your hardest worker. I think we got to go with Jeremy Johnson and in, in, in probably in the history of the program. The guy is just a, a worker. He's the head coach at Aurora now. was it Avon. Two-time All-American for you. Obviously, you got to go with – I got to go with Jake Percival. is probably the greatest wrestler and the greatest work body of work. I think your toughest guy, though, is the guy you just uh, hired as your assistant coach in Cody Walters, uh, the Junkyard Dogs, the bookend All-American, the freshman, and the senior All-American. Yeah. yeah. His senior year, though, in Madison Square Garden, what happens to, the, to him first match of the NCAA tournament? Tears his ACL. What do most guys do? We're already on all already an all American. I was an all American as a freshman. What is what does ninety nine percent of the wrestlers do? Uh ninety nine percent of them probably aren't going to wrestle. But uh, it, it wasn't even a question. I mean, we first of all, I don't I'm I don't know that we know his ACL was torn at the time. We thought his knee was hurt, but not you know, not the end well, of the yeah, damn world. Okay, so they're going to disqual a medical professional. Oh, you got torn ACL. You can't wrestle. You're going to get disqualified. They're probably not going to even let the kid wrestle. We get that. Yeah. So, but, but yeah, he, he was, uh, he was a tough son of a gun. He, and he's, he, <laughs> and for him, um, man, he, he was super talented, you know, worked hard, did all the right things, all those things, but he had a knack for rolling around. And in five years, I don't ever remember like, you know how some guys scramble around and you're like, oh, he turned the wrong way and got taken down. I don't ever remember Cody turning the wrong way ever. Like he had a knack for always, always scrambling the right way. Yeah, finding a way. Finding a way. Finding a way to win. Hey, man, if you're going to scramble, you better be winning scrambles, right? And, yeah. I, and I think that's from a young age. You know, he learned that and he just found a way to, to get better and always progress. But how do you get a guy through – who you know is, you know, pretty jacked up, hurt right away. How do you get him through? Like, because he lost that first match, right? No, I, he won it, I think. It was uh, South Dakota State, I believe. I think okay. he won that one. When and did then, he lose? I think I, I think he lost in the quarters to uh, the Iowa State guy. Um, I remember. Yeah, I remember what you're talking about. Uh, yes. Jeez, uh, I can't think of his name. Marcus. Weatherspoon. 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 Right? Yes. Yes. That guy yeah. was pretty good. That guy was super mad that year for some reason. He was mad at the media. Um, <laughs> Who did he have to beat in the round of 12? He beat Alex Mayer for 7th and 8th, didn't he? The Iowa guy? Yeah. Uh, is that the year he had to beat Blaze Butler? Who beat him in the Mac think, Finals? I think it was. I think to, it was Blaze Butler. He had to beat, dude. He had to beat Blaze Butler to to be an All American, and that guy I think beat him in the duel, and beat him in the Mac Finals. Uh, but we beat him in the round of twelve to become a two time All American, or he beat him. 
Hold on. I hold on. I'm going to tell you right now. He beat Blaze Butler 4-2 to two in sudden victory. Yeah. And then you guys lost to Kent from Penn, Casey Kent. Yep. And then for 7th and 8th, he beat Alex Meyer. Yeah. Alex Meyer. Oh, my God. What a – oh, my God. Listen to the weight, dude. Bo Nickel was the one. Chandler Rogers is the nine seed. Upper Lee, the eight seed. Brunson from Illinois is the five. Nate Nate Jackson was the 12 seed. Alex Meyer was the 13. Ethan Ramos of uh, North Carolina was the four. Blaze Butler was the three. Wow. Miles Martin was the 11. He won. He beat uh, Bo Nickel in the final. Um, Cody was the seven. Cody lost to Leland Witherspoon, 5-3 in the quarters, and then dropped down against Blaze Butler and beat him in 4-2 in sudden victory. Who did he – did he beat Weatherman in the All-American round his freshman year? Is that who he beat? Yeah. Beat Weatherman. Yeah, I remember – because I – you know, I, I – I, what's cool when they get in the media pressure is you get to sit right on the mat and watch it all. Yeah. And I try and go to the blood I, – I don't – you know, obviously the semis are great. But going and sitting in those two corners, or you know, those with the four corner dog bone, you know, it's hard because you gotta like it, it's a, a bottleneck in the middle, and you can't really be on both. So yeah. it's good to pick a corner, and I try and get you know the corner where the Mac guys are, or Ohio, obviously Ohio guys. But um, I love it. I remember the Weatherman one. I remember the Blaze Butler one in Madison Square Garden. What just what a what a freak! What hey. When you knew you could get him back, how quick did you jump at getting him back to Athens to be your assistant coach? Well, I, I think we've talked about it for a long time, and it was never um, it was never the right opportunity, never the right time. It, it, you know, like um, he went down to Gardner Webb and was head assistant there for a couple of years, and then when he left there, we really didn't have a position open, so he went to West Virginia and. Um, and then it was COVID and when, when spawns left and it was COVID and we couldn't hire anybody, um, you, you know, so it was, it was just, we could never make it work out, but, um, I, he was out of wrestling for a year or two, maybe I can't remember, um, kind of looking to, to, to get back into wrestling. And, and we had talked about it a few times and, uh, you know, when, um, uh, when uh, Hunter left, I called him and see if he was interested. And he was actually interviewing for jobs at the time, and um, it, it was just it just worked out perfect time for both of us. And up until that point, it really hadn't been uh, even close to a good time. It's crazy because he was working in like a steel mill. I want to say he was like up here in Northeast Ohio working in some steel mill, and then he gets the opportunity was, to get back. Right? It was a steel mill, wasn't it? He was, yeah, like the director of shipping or something. <laughs> Which he's not in there like smelting steel and getting hot, you know, hot smelted molten lava steel, you know, uh, or near him, right? He's making, but he was still, he was still walking through, you, you know, and, yeah. and, and doing stuff. Uh, uh, so yeah, in that, I, I don't want that he, job. I'm not going to lie to you. I don't want that job. Gotti, I want nothing to do with that job. <laughs> he can have that job seven days a week over me and, and twice on Sunday. I'm all right with that. So you get him down there. Does he still wrestle a lot? Because he was actually competing again for Tim Flynn at WVU. Is he wrestling a lot for you guys? Yeah, he 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 wrestles almost every day. I mean, I'd say both of our, you know, he and Shakur both wrestle almost every day. Can the old man still get it? Can the old injured... No, uh, Bedford Chanel Firebird. Can he still get it? Oh yeah, without a doubt. First of all, he, he's not a seventy-four pounder anymore. Uh, <laughs> no. He is strong as an ox, and uh, uh, still the same old, same old. He's pretty tough to take down. Pretty tough to get away from. Pretty tough to ride. Um, it, it'll be a while before before anybody can beat him in the room. You guys have always done a really good job at recruiting Northeast Ohio. Literally the three guys that we've talked about in your coaching tenure, 25 years, going on 26. Um, all Northeast Ohio guys, right now, you're 74, 84. You're a national qualifier, Sal Perrine. Obviously, he's got connections. Uh, Cody's dad was Sal's head coach. 
at Nordonia. So obviously there's a connection there. Tell me what those scraps look like when Sal's healthy, when they're both healthy and they're both wrestling. Uh, Sal is the ultimate. They're both the same guy. They both hate to lose. They're both both competitors. Sal has a gas tank like nobody's business and is just going to keep coming and coming and coming. And, uh, uh, you know, I'd say – you know, they're, they're going to be dog fights for the next three years, really. Will we see Sal back in your lineup for the Mac tournament? You'll see Sal back in our lineup this weekend. So he's back. Yeah. Cause I know he's been in and out, uh, missing some stuff. I, and obviously I'm a Sal Perrine fan. I'm a Northeast Ohio guy. So I like seeing Sal Perrine uh, succeed. He qualified last year. That guy's got to be hungry. Who else do you guys see a breakout coming for this year? Um, you guys can win the MAC tournament. I know your dual record doesn't uh, reflect that, but I think you guys can win the MAC tournament. I think a host of teams can win the MAC tournament and do what Lockhaven did last year because this new MAC is a lot different than the 2001 MAC tournament when it was six teams. Now you got 13, right? Correct. <clears throat> What's the key to winning the MAC, Joel? Well, you got to put two two days of good wrestling together. I, I think for us, that's kind of the thing we've been focusing on is, hey, um, we, we can still win the, the MAC tournament. We've been super positive with our guys. That's kind of where our um, kind of where our focus is. Uh, I, I think for for us, the guys that are wrestling real well, or Sal's starting to wrestle really well. Uh, Zane Lehman's wrestling really well. Um, uh, uh, Alec Hagan's coming around. Peyton Keller's kind of the babyface assassin out of the group as far as the young guys really doing a good job. Slifka's Slifka stumbled a little bit early in the year, but it's really been coming around lately. So, um, uh, Kyron Hagan, same thing, kind of got off to a slow start, but it's been coming around a lot lately. So, I, I think all those upperclassmen, Carson Brewer, we got to kind of hop on their back and, and have them take us to, to a Mac title. Really. Why do you recruit Northeast Ohio? So good. Um, Kent state loses a lot of recruiting battles to you. And obviously that's the one I look at, you know, that's the rivalry I was a part of. That's the rivalry I helped create a trophy for. Why do you take so many guys out from underneath their nose? I mean, Walters, old man, Walters and Jim Anderson graduated and went to high school together. Well, I think it's two way street. I mean, I look at it as like Kent takes guys from us as well. Uh, I, you know, I I think Ohio University, um, a lot of it, man. It's a, it's a great place to go to school. It's a, you're going to get a great education. It's a beautiful campus. It sells itself a lot. Um, and, and then for us, it's it's kind of selling those guys a vision of where we want to go and what we want to be. You know, you and Tom Borelli are the two longest tenured coaches, and obviously we know father time always wins, right? Mother nature and father time are both undefeated. <laughs> uh, you know, we talked uh, yesterday, you gave me a call, but we talked, and I, you know, ultimately the question I want to ask is how much longer do you think you can do this? I know you can't speak for Tom Borelli, and he's been at it a little bit longer than you, but how much longer can Joel Greenley do this? How's your body feel? Can you still get on the mat? obviously probably not as much as you used to and what what do you have left on a contract and how many years do you realistically think you can do this at a high level <laughs> i don't know that's a tough question i mean when i was in college and or when i first started coaching i was like there's no way you can do it past 50 well i'm well past 50 um i i had signed a four-year contract in july um and, and i think you got to look at that like hey what what happens when four years is up how do I feel? How's the team doing? Where are we at? Um, all those things. So I wouldn't put it, I'm done in four years or I'm done in two years or one year or seven years or anything like that on it as far as how my body feels and all that. It doesn't feel like it did when I was 25. I'll tell you that. Um, I still get on the mat and and roll around not very often, not as much as I used to, a couple times a week maybe. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, that's a hard question to answer. I'd say, well, 
it's easy four more years and then we go from there so you're definitely you definitely feel like you you've got the four-year contract started in july you feel like you can give them the four years and then see what happens from there that's what i think i i mean uh I think I think having two good assistants makes it a, a lot easier. Guys that can take take um, you know a lot of that load as far as as working out with guys and things like that off your plate. All right, that that makes a huge difference. I mean, as long as those those two guys are still doing a great job and um, our, our team's successful, and I think I can I can put Ohio University in a better place tomorrow than it is today, I, I would continue to do it. Um, but who knows? I mean, I, I still I still love being around college kids. I still, you know, love helping our guys try to try to reach their goals and, and get better and better. Um, I think probably when when that doesn't excite me anymore or that's no fun, then it's probably time to to step away. You're raised uh, a son and a daughter in, in Athens, right? And they went to Athens, didn't they? Yes. Did your son graduate with Joe Burrow? I forget. Yeah, Walker Walker's in the same grade as Joe Burrow and, and Maddie. My daughter is, is, I'd say, good friends with him. That's wild to me, because here's what's crazy about it, and we we've talked about this before: the Joe Burrow effect. You can be great wherever you from, where wherever you're from. Wherever you want to go, you can be great. And I think that that guy epitomizes it more than anybody because the guy's from Athens, Ohio. The dad came from Ames, right? They came from Ames when he was a little kid, didn't they? Uh, yeah. He, 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 I, I, I'm a, I, don't, I don't know the whole timeline, but I know his dad was in Ames. Um, I don't know if he was there all the way. I think Joe moved here maybe third grade. Okay. Uh, so, so I don't know if he was there the whole time or he had to stop it. No, you know what? I think they were in North Dakota. They went from Ames to North Dakota state okay. maybe. And then to Athens. His, I think his dad was a defensive coordinator or, or uh, North Dakota state. So that guy's an Athens guy, right? That guy comes in, he goes through school all through with your kids. And then to see what that guy's done at every level, right? High school. He took Athens high school. They, lo they lose a 56 52 state final game to Toledo Central Catholic or something crazy like that, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's like not some crazy like one of the highest scoring games in OHSA state final history. Dude, he's he's doing to the, the to the NFL what he did to the TVC down here, just in a different level. <laughs> it's unbelievable. And then you know, obviously, he does the Ohio State thing, grad transfers to LSU. He's the best player on the best fo college football team in history, the LSU Tigers. The year they yeah. won it, they won the most games in history. They won all the major awards. He was a Heisman Trophy winner. Uh, I mean, obviously, he changed things from being from Athens. And don't you know what he did with your guys' food bank down there is just an example of how powerful and how much influence a guy like that has, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it was over half a million dollars. So your food in bank, just talking about it in in a speech, right? Yeah, in the Heisman Trophy speech. It's wild to think. The influence that guy's in. so I think Joe Burrow, you know, like to to the point of you can be from anywhere and be great. Oh, without a doubt, you what don't is, have to be is, from New York City or Los Angeles. You don't have to have LeBron James as your as your dad. You can be from humble beginnings, and you you can be from Athens. You can be from Cedar Rapids. You can be, you know what I mean? Like you can be from all these different places. And I think there's a, a misconception and like ah, you're from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. You can never do it. And I think that that Joe Burrow is the shining example of you can be from, you know, you can be from where, wherever. You can be from Minot, North Dakota. You can be from Cedar Rapids, right? You can be from all these different right. places. I did. Right? And he, he, like, like, I don't know him well. I know who he is. I know his dad pretty well, things like that. But. I, I think the cool part about it is everything you hear is like he's a great guy, super hard worker, last one to leave the the field, the gym, all all those things. And uh, I don't I don't think it came easy for him. I you know obviously it didn't come easy for him. And uh, you know that's kind of the lesson everybody can learn out of that. It's like awesome. It's like such an awesome thing. Raising your kids in Athens, right? There's all these yeah. different college towns. You know, you could be at home and, you know, you could have raised them in Waverly if you would have got the job at Northern Iowa. It didn't work out that way. You raise them in Athens. You know, um, 
what was it like having your family and raising your aunt family in, in a rural part, Appalachia part of, of Ohio? Well, first of all, Waverly, Iowa uh, makes Athens look like the big city. So, <laughs> <That's actually true. laughs> That's what no. Hey, Wartburg's actually really nice. That's a really nice college, and that's in Waverly. Yeah, it is. It, it is. Yeah. And, and that's not a knock on Waverly. It's just small. I mean, um, I think when we were growing up, it was six to 8,000. Yeah. You know, I, that's, and then, and believe it or not, uh, we had maybe 145, something like that in our graduating class, and we wrestled in the big school class. What? Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> No way. That's like a D3 school in Ohio. Hey, oh, that's crazy. That was dude. a big school class, bud. <laughs> what? Okay. What was it like? Did you, first off, how did your wife like Athens? Uh, I, I, I think we both like it. I mean, I, like, I think my, you know, for my wife, it wasn't, it wasn't a like or dislike of Athens at the start. It was more of, Hey, we're, 11 hours away from family and uh, actually Walker was a, a one-year-old and Maddie was born here in Athens. I mean, it, 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 I, I'm trying to think if it was 1999, March 4th, Maddie was born at like 6.30 in the morning and I got on a bus to go to the MAC tournament at 8. Uh, <laughs> in, in Buffalo, in Buffalo, I believe. I, I, yeah, so... So I don't think it was a, a matter of like or dislike. It was a matter of, hey, it, it was hard to be that far away from family um, for a while. But I think, you know, we, we both love Athens now. It's a great place to raise your kids. It was a, it was a great place to work. It's, um, you know, if you like the outdoors and things like that, it's, it's an unbelievable place. So you guys, you know, you, you're there and you're, is your brother still in Ames? Yeah, my younger brother Justin and his his son actually plays football for Iowa State. I thought he wrestled there. He's playing football. Well, he he did the whole gray shirt year thing, and you know how you can't work out with the team only RTCs and da 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 da. So he started kind of fell in with some football player buddies, and they started lifting get together, and the coaches go through, and he's six seven two fifty five at the time, and. Uh, <laughs> Well, Justin's super tall, right? Justin's six six seven, isn't he? He's six six, I think. Yeah, six six. And so, what is your what's what's your nephew's name? Uh, uh, Gabe. Gabe. Okay. So Gabe's six seven. Is he two eighty now? How big is he? Three hundo. What? <laughs> seven three hundred. Oh my god! So he's got NFL size. He's a monster. I guess he's fast. I you know he never played it down to football in high school. Just wrestled no the whole time. No way. Are you serious? Two-time runner-up in Iowa at heavyweight. You know, heck, we recruited him. He ended up going to Iowa State. And uh, um, like I said, I think it just kind of worked out for him. I I guess so. He kind of grew into his massive frame. And so he he probably dwarfs, he probably dwarfs you and Justin. Probably. I haven't... You know, I haven't seen him in a while. I mean, uh, you know, I haven't seen him this whole year. So the whole year he's been playing football and put on all the size and all that. I haven't seen him. So um, I'm kind of anxious to see him because that's, uh, that's a lot. That's a lot of man right there. Six, seven, three hundred. So here, here's a question. You you actually coached against Jermail Porter, who played two seasons as a uh, a practice squad player. Uh, he was with the the – Patriots and the Chiefs. Yep. Do you feel your nephew has what in him what what uh, a Jermail Porter had? Could he be a guy that gets in one of those fifty three man rosters and then just kind of kind of snowballs and, and and can get into the NFL and makes it some years under his belt? You know what? I don't. I, I I I think in the right position. I think all that. I think he's a pretty good athlete. Always has been a pretty good athlete. Um, I don't know enough about football to say, but I know like, Hey, Stephen Neal, pretty dang good athlete. I knew him pretty well. And he, you know, what's he got three Super Bowl rings. Yeah. He's pretty good. Uh, can, can he play for the Cyclones? 
Yeah, we'll find out this year. I mean, um, I talked to my brother the other day because the Cyclones come to Athens third week in September or second week in September, something like that. So I was like, hey, you guys got to come out. We'll, we'll we'll get a tailgate and get the whole, the whole Greenlee family out here. That's going to be a wild time. And that's awesome that you guys, they're going to be able to come out. Well, everybody – was everybody or your are your are your parents still around? Like how many siblings? How many Greenleys could we how many massive Viking humans could we see <laughs> in Athens in September? Uh I I hopefully a bunch. I mean, I got an older brother, a younger brother. Um, obviously they're 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 both married. Um, got a couple other nieces and nephews. My mom's still around. I mean I if if my brothers are coming out, she's for sure coming out. I love it. <laughs> so I love it. Is you your older know, brother? Is your older brother in Iowa still? Yeah, yeah. So you're the only you're the only you're the, the you're the black sheep. You moved out into Athens, huh? I'm pretty sure the only one out of the whole Greenlee family to ever leave. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's wild for me to think that. Yeah, I didn't realize that you had. I I knew he was a big, massive kid. I knew Justin's son Gabe was 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 a stud, but I and I I thought he went to either U and I or Iowa State. I did not realize he he kind of shifted over. And will he have four years of eligibility left? You said he gray shirted. Will he have the four years, or did he burn a year this year? So th- this year would be his red shirt year. He'll have four years after this year. That's amazing, girl Joel. That now you got me on the lookout. I like that stuff. That's awesome. Those are cool stories. Um, Justin knocked off. Kerry McCoy. McCoy and Kerry McCoy was in like, he was on like one of these Yanni. He was on one of these like uh Yanni Diakama Hollis win streaks or like a Spencer Lee type win streak. Wasn't he? So it was in Carver Hawkeye arena semifinals of the NCAA tournament. I think he wins that match and he either ties or beats Gable's consecutive win streak at the time. No way. Oh, it was unbelievable. My God. It was unbelievable. So obviously I'm in the corner and I'm excited as anybody. And I gave, I gave Carver Hawkeye one of the whirly bird things and it brought the roof down. <laughs> it was, uh, it was fun. Who did your brother wrestle in the finals then? Tolly Thompson. He wrestled Tolly in the finals. He, uh, he wrestled Tolly one year. No, uh, he was in the finals twice. Uh, yeah, I can't remember what happened yesterday, but that was like. <laughs> <laughs> I can you listen. I can just look those things up. It's not one a of them game. was Tolly Thompson. Okay, I think his junior year was McCoy, and then he beat McCoy his senior year in the semis, and then he lost to Tolly in the in the in the finals. That's right. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And now Justin is a professor in Ames, right? He were he's uh he works for the FDA. He's uh he he just. He's the acting director of the FDA and in, in Ames right now. I just talked to him two days ago. Not not a big not a big not a big response. Food and Drug Administration, federal organ. No, not a big job. He's uh, he's got his uh, his doctor of vet, veterinary medicine degree and his PhD in animal pathology. So he has two doctorate degrees. I got the looks, but he got the smarts. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> How long has that mustache been on your face? Uh, at least 1984. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> what were what year in school were you? And then how, were you a senior or junior? Oh, I was a sophomore, but you couldn't have mustaches in in wrestle at the time. So I first had it when I was a sophomore, but you had to shave it off during the season. So uh, th- this this one since 1984. <laughs> 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 when are the shirts coming back? I I don't have mine anymore. They really? No, I don't oh, have I, it anymore. I wore it I out. I should find. I should. I should do that. Uh, uh, maybe we'll do it for the MAC tournament. I'll, I'll work on that. That shirt, but it's got to be that drawing. Whoever did that drawing, it's got to be that drawing. No, yeah, well, it was a guy on our team at the time. Uh, did that you got to get just get a picture of it, and they can you know they can like recreate that like nothing. Oh, now. I still have mine, bud. I still uh, have one. Show <laughs> all you do is you take it and say, "I want this." Print seven hundred of them. Make sure that there's a couple four X's because I need one for every day of the week. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you had to, could you grab a hold of? Was it Padilla? Your your heavyweight right now? Yeah. Could you grab a hold of him and put it on him? 
I wouldn't have to. I just could. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Hey, big uh, Kent State versus Cleveland State duel tomorrow. I know you beat both of them, so it's nothing to you. But my guy Nick Nemeth is going to be there, a.k.a. Dolph Ziggler. Do you have any messages for him? Tell him I said hi. All right. <laughs> tell him. What, what, should, what should I tell him about that time in Athens when it went to a replay in the back room against the Garino guy from Buffalo? Is there anything I can tell him about that? I had nothing to do with it. You could tell him that. <laughs> he still thinks you do. Oh, I had I nothing love it. to do with it. I that. love everything about it. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, MAC tournament this year is in Fairfax, Virginia? Yeah. George Mason? Yeah. NCA's in Tulsa? Yep. I love it. What else uh, you got for I, me, Joel? What else you got for me? Come on. You got to have something else for me. That's all I got. I, uh, yeah, You know, I'm in uh, – I I don't want to I don't want to I don't want to beat a dead horse but the grudge match thing but I do want to like I think it's a great idea I mean from it's from the your standpoint idea. Of, it's your I, idea it's not my idea stop it but I think it's you know I I think you can build rivalries like that and it's fun and it's fun for the fans and you're going to get big crowds and wrestling needs that um you, you know if I would love to do something with Cleveland State central michigan all, all that stuff i just think uh um that makes it exciting for everybody you know josh has done a great job at cleveland state they're getting better and better by the day and um he, he's got some good things going there and it's some excitement going and um all those little things help i, I absolutely agree man they they have uh josh has done just a fabulous job this year and that's actually going to be a really good duel tomorrow i think they've got some injuries cleveland state's got some injuries that should be a good duel, even though your duel with Cleveland, uh, Kent State was not a good duel. It was but you fun. You guys had a good time. It was fun. Yeah, I agree. I, mean, I, I think going into that duel, I, I was like, you know, it was good going into that duel, and I, I, I was concerned, you know, like, hey, how are we going to pull this thing out? And, and, uh, I, I do think. I don't know, maybe we caught them at the right time or whatever. They 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 scrapped it out with Central on Sunday. We were Yeah, then they had, a, they had a really tough duel with Central, actually. Yeah, so. Yeah, that's just how duels are. Kyle, Joel, do people get it? Do people get how – when you bring these people into your office and they're, it's their first kid that's going to college or their first kid that's wrestling in or, or doing a D1 sport, do people really get how tough college wrestling is? Do they really understand? No, and I tried to explain that to him too. Like I, I tell everybody, like, hey, it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, but it was the most rewarding thing I've I've ever done. And there's going to be times that that it's tough, and and I I stand in front of our team and tell them on a you know a yearly yearly basis. Nobody understands what you're going through. They think they do, but they don't understand it. Your mom and dad don't understand. Your your girlfriend doesn't. Your buddies don't understand. Your people, the only the people in this room understand how hard this really is. So tough. It's just such a, it's such a hard thing. And it's just like, people will ask me questions and I, you know, it's like, it's almost like some people aren't even have, are, they're not even quality. It's like, it's not this rude or arrogant thing, but it's just like, you're almost not even qualified to talk about it with me because you've never had your face <laughs> kicked in. You've never You've never been at the stage at Michigan State. Like, I wrestled this guy, a three-time All-American. It was a Georgian guy, 197-pounder from Michigan State. Mr. Vili. Oh, yeah, yeah. Dude was a stud, right? Yeah. Bow and arrowed me three times on the stage. And I remember at one point, my dad and brothers were like, you got to pin yourself. <laughs> like, you got to pin yourself. And I had a bloody nose, and he had me such that it pulled up in my eye socket. And they're just like, you got it. You got to find a way to get, you got to pin yourself. And I'm just like, <laughs> I, I, I can't even, but I was, I had too much pride. And all right. In five, in five years of college wrestling, how many days did you wrestle and feel good? I mean, rarely, rarely ever. I remember the worst I ever felt. I lost the true second match in uh, Athens that year. You guys won it. Yeah. I lost the true second. Badnar beat uh, the Faustman guy from central Michigan. Yep. And then 
I saw I, I was seated ahead of the I was seated ahead of somebody. It was weird. I was just seated ahead of Bednar and he was pissed yeah. off and beat me up. Um and then Bednar beat him and I hadn't had a previous match with him. And then there was like two bids. Um, or however you guys did it, then it was real weird. But they're like, Oh yeah, you threw yeah. seconds. Wild up. card. Yeah. And I remember I was like, Yeah, I'm not gonna wrestle that. And I remember Jim Anderson they walked me around the combo because it's a big circle. Yeah. And he called me every he was making up curse words to call me. You're <laughs> soft. You gotta do this. Your team needs you. Well, then I found out afterwards they don't score the true second place matches. The team points are already factored in. Yep. He's like, you're letting your team down. We can still win this thing. Cause that team race that year was really close. I think you guys beat central by two and they beat us by a point or two. Yeah. Something like that. It was close. It was like super close. And I remember like, and I tore, I tore my ACL again, but I wrestled the Faustman guy. And I remember Dave Bulliard and that Mitch Hancock guy were heckling me in the corner. And I threw my blood plug at him. Mitch Hancock was a red shirt that year, wasn't yep. he? And so was Dave. Dave Boyard was as well. And I threw yeah. my blood plug at him. And the Faustman guy, he stole my lunch in the dual meet, but that that was real close. Like he beat me like five to four or something. He was a lot better than me. But um, I think you know that's tough. The true second matches are really tough. Tell your guys wrestle through the true second, because whoever lost in the Mac final, they're gonna have a really hard time coming back. And win oh, a it's, second it, place it, match. It, it's an it's next door to impossible task. I don't like that at all. But uh, dude, that is, hey, I'm telling you right now, that guy was so much better than me. But I think he was so demoralized and crushed from losing to Bednar in the finals. And then it was real quick turnaround then too. I remember less than an hour or right yeah, at an hour. Yeah, because he was the 197, the second to last title match, and um, when I had just wrestled for third and fourth. Um, and one for third and fourth, but I was like, this sucks. This is terrible. But your guys got to know that. And I think, was it Sal that lost the true second last year? Yeah. To the Buffalo guy. And that Buffalo guy, you know, John Stutzman had him ready to go. And and Sal will tell the guys, hey, man, you got to be ready for that true second match. Like you're saying, I don't like it either. But I liked it that day, but I didn't like it because my coach, you know, drug me through a knot hole <laughs> verbally. <laughs> And I did it, and I, you know, but hey, do you think I have any? You did, it for, you did it for the team points. You did, I it, did for it for the team, team points. <laughs> uh, that was weird then when you guys would take guys, you'd skip over guys, you'd, you know, a guy would get third in the conference, but you'd take, you'd skip the second place guy, you'd take the third. I think they did it with like Brian Singleton one year. It's, you know what I mean? Like it was when we had 14 bids or something, was something like that. My first four. year, my first year in the MAC, we had 11. Unreal, man. So the ten champs went and won wild card. <laughs> you had two, you had two finalists in the NCAs. <laughs> I love it. Hey, yep. how's your wife? Central doing? was seventh that year. What's that? Central was seventh that year. We were that's, ninth, and they were seventh. That's right. That's oh my god, two two times. Wow, what a team! And I think Casey Cunningham was a runner up that year, wasn't he? Uh. Yeah, yeah he, was I think so. he was a runner up in 98, and then Greenfield was an All American. Beak was an All American. The other Cunningham was an All American. Yeah, wedding. Ryan Cunningham, I believe, was an All American. I mean, yeah, it was just, they had a really good team. I, I, I've I been meaning to ask you, how's your wife doing? She's doing great. Yeah. Yeah. Hanging in there, making it happen. Yeah, she's uh, plugging away, making, uh, just designing kitchen and bathroom cabinets and stuff like that. And I mean, she's sitting on the couch right now working. Always grinding, right? Yep. And are both of your kids graduated? Yeah, they both live in Chicago, living and working in Chicago. Are they making more money than you yet? Walker definitely is making more money. Maddie, <laughs> not so much, but <laughs> you want that though. That's what I want. Heck yeah, I want my kids to make more money than me, man. I think that that's a that's a thing. I think that that yeah. is an important thing that you know that your kids have, find more success than you do. That's just my opinion. I agree 100%. They're, they're going to have to make more money because I'm taking mine with me. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, spend it all. They don't need it. Um, <laughs> all right, Joel. I appreciate the time with you tonight. I'm looking around here. Um, I mean, we got our defense soap in the back. I talk about that all the time. Defend what you build if you guys aren't. Um, I appreciate you coming on. Thank you for the time. You guys, good luck to you guys in Fairfax at the MAC tournament. 
And then hopefully Thanks. we'll see some Bobcats in Tulsa. Right now, if you had a number to give me, what, what feels like a good number? Six, five, four? What do you guys uh, feel like? I think five. Five think sounds five very is. doable from what I've seen out of your team. You got a capable team. A healthy Sal Perine, I feel like, is a guy that's in, in there. Slivka. Slivka, you know, he's he's going to be in a battle for that 165 at the MAC. How that's do you feel? I, I about, think those are two tough weight classes, too. Yeah, and then the Hagens, right? Yep. You got to feel good about the Hagens. Feel and, good uh, about Brewer. Feel good about Lehman. Yeah. Of course, we all feel good about Lehman. He's a Northeast Ohio guy. Yeah. The rear guy, right? Yep. Good. I love it. All right, Joel. Thank you for the time. Stick around. I'll talk to you afterwards. Joel Greenlee, Ohio Cash Podcast. We could have made it the Kent State Wrestling Talk since you guys just took the trophy <laughs> from him, but we'll we'll stick with Ohio Cash Podcast. Joel, stick around. All right. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I appreciate you, man. No doubt.